Good morning. Welcome to Capital City Christian Church. My name is Logan. I'm one of the elders here. This is my lovely wife, Mackenzie. Good morning. We are so excited that you're here. If this is your first time here, make sure to say hi to somebody that's got a name tag. Hopefully you got a name tag when you came in. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're with us there. And if you've been here before, welcome back. So last week we started talking about how there are two different types of people and we're going to continue through there. So, you know, we watched this. Um, We're going to learn a little bit more about two types of people and um, how we could see how those come out um, going forward this week. That's right. So you saw the video with Kramer, and with there being two types of people, half of you may be saying, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, going all the way to E, that makes sense, right? The other half of you that gave extreme anxiety to. So, you know, we've been focusing a lot on getting connected with each other, and and we've got the name tags now, right? So rather than us just stand up here and talk, we want to talk to you guys and see, did this clip, did it give you anxiety, or are you one of those people that you'll take it all the way down to E, and E means you've got an extra 30 miles, or... Do you go and fill it up at half tank? So, All right, Cinnamon, I what got do you... someone. Hold on. All I've right. got somebody right here. Okay, so I've got the Sharp family here. I've got Brian and Leah. Brian, do you let it happen? Do you get it all the way to E? Half tank. Half tank. Half tank fills it up. So all this, right, all right. Hang on. We, we got, got something it. different. Cinnamon? All the way past E. All the way past E. Not to E, past E. All right, here we go. All right, I've got another couple over here. Can you... Lindsay. Sorry, I have a name tag. Russ. Okay, guys, so what, what is it for you? Um, I go until my gas light comes on. Yeah. Yeah. But when the light comes on, you stop. Okay. Absolutely. Do, do you agree? No. <laughs> Not as bad as Brian. About a quarter tank. Quarter right. tank. Okay. One more. One more. We got Scott back here. Scott, what do you do? I am half tank, but my lovely wife on stage is all the way to E. <laughs> oh, that's, that's some conflict. That's some Jerry Springer stuff right there. Oh, wow. All right, well. Since you got, you know, we put some of you all on the spot, let's see what you all think of us. So you, you kind of have got to know Logan and I a little bit, so let's see. Opposites sometimes attract what I'm studying out here. So how many of you all think Logan is the one that lets it get down to E? How many of you all think I let it get down to E? Hey, you guys are all wrong. We both do. That's right. So if you see us on the side of the road, uh, bring a gas tank, please. Please stop. We're waiting for gas. So Thank again, you. two types of people. Uh, you may be one, you may be the other, but really, I mean, the fact that we both take it all the way down to E could just mean that we are more holy, and here's why. Well, because we're trying to empty ourselves? Is that it? Yeah. Okay, well, we might not be more holy, but we are trying to be in line uh, with Philippians 2. So that's what we want to talk about. So you can see on the screen, think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages that he, of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. You saw in that last piece, you saw Will Bow. That sounds like future. But the cool thing is we get a chance to do that every week here at Cap City. You could do it throughout the week. So let's stand, let's bow through this worship, and let's sing together. Come on. 
to do great things and you've done it in our lives, you've done it in this church, and we expect you to do something even more. As we confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord, we bow our whole heart to him. We bow everything and we allow him to be in charge of it all. Father, we want to follow his example. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Why don't you guys have a seat? Good morning. Really, really glad you're here. For those of you connecting online, glad you're connecting with us. And I hope you sense the presence of God this morning. Now there's a difference, I hope, between a hero and an idol. Now I know we use the word sloppily, but there is a difference. We idolize people with great talent, boatloads of money, or maybe a perfect body, right? People with a perfect self. American idols. Heroes are different. What are they about? Courage, honor, self-sacrifice for a cause way bigger than self. The denial of self. Have you got any heroes? We have cultural heroes, almost universally revered. I wish they were universally revered. We honored quite a few of our heroes last week, the firemen and cops who ran in when others were running away when the terrorists flew their planes into the Twin Towers, or the soldiers who went into harm's way to prevent it from happening again if they could. They're heroes. For me, guys like Martin Luther King, he was a hero in my eyes. Sully Sullenberger, whose calm courage saved who knows how many lives when their plane dropped into the Hudson River. Those are cultural heroes. But I suspect you've got your private heroes as well. I do. People who have run in when others were running away from you or whose strength and courage and honor and self-sacrifice gave you the strength that you needed at a time you needed it badly. I've got them. I have heroes in this church. They probably wouldn't be on your list but I've seen their courage, their honor, their sacrifice for causes bigger than themselves. They're not my idols, but they are my heroes. They've challenged me and inspired me. Some of them are in this room. I'm not going to name names. The greatest leaders, the greatest leaders are not idols. They're heroes. Now, there are some so-called leaders that we do idolize. But there are other leaders that we kind of revere. We idolize those who have tremendous talent or bigger-than-life personalities. They've got this charisma. Maybe they've got a boatload of money or a boatload of power or a host of fawning, sycophantic followers. They get the headlines. They get the crowds. But there are also leaders we kind of revere. They're the ones who tend to build something way bigger than themselves, something that matters, something that lasts. Now, I try to read some books on leadership. I think these are two of the best. 
Simon Sinek's Leaders Eat Last, and Jim Collins' Good to Great, classic. Sinek talks about that second kind of leader, not the ones that we sometimes idolize, but those that we tend to revere. And what's interesting is that inside the front cover, this is unusual, inside the front cover, this is what's printed. It's kind of small. It might be hard for you to read, but let me read it to you. He says, real leaders, the kind of leaders we revere, they're the ones who run headfirst into the unknown. They rush towards danger. They put their own interests aside to protect us or to pull us into the future. Real leaders, the leaders we revere, would sooner sacrifice what is theirs to save what is ours, and they would never sacrifice what is ours to save what is theirs. This is what it means to be a real leader. It means they do choose to go first into danger, head first into the unknown. And when we feel sure they'll keep us safe, we'll march behind them. And we will work tirelessly to see their visions come to life, and we will proudly call ourselves their followers. In other words, for a real leader, it's not about me. It's not about self. Cynic talks about leadership in the Marines. Now, Billy Joe, our communications guru, she's a Marine, and she gets passionate talking about this. In the Marines, leaders really do eat last. They do. The most junior will eat first. The most senior eat last because they believe the, the true price of level five leadership is the willingness to put the needs of others above your own. It kind of separates those who just have power, a lot of those. People who just have authority, many of those, from great leaders. Because for a great leader, your people matter. And you're working to build something way bigger than just yourself. And you're willing to make personal sacrifices to get it done. What fascinates me is that Jim Collins says exactly the same thing in his classic Good to Great. He says there are five levels of leaders. There's a highly capable individual... Maybe he's the best guy on the team. Boatload of talent, maybe. But that's just level one. And then there's the contributing team member. He's the guy who makes everybody else better. He works well with others. They may not be the most talented, but they make everybody else better. That's level two. And then there's the competent manager. He's the guy that's good at getting the right people in the right seat on the bus, right? So you can get the job done. That's level three. You need competent managers. And then there's the effective leader. Effective leader is good at casting vision. He's good at raising the bar so that people get better at what they do. They're visionaries. That's level four. Believe it or not, there's a level above that. They're the great leaders. They're the ones who are genuinely, it is not about me. It's not about self. It's about my people. It's about our mission. Great leaders change values. They change culture. They change lives. The level five leaders have this weird blend, this compelling blend of personal humility and fearless courage. I don't care who gets the credit. Let's just get the job done. Oftentimes they're quiet. They're always humble. Modest, sometimes they're even shy. But it's packaged with this ferocious resolve to do whatever it takes to get the job done. No matter what the personal cost. You may not know their names because they don't care about their name. But those who are close to them, who know them well, they know they're heroes. And I wonder, I'm not surprised we have idols. I mean, those with amazing talent, boatloads of money, perfect bodies. But I wonder whether we revere heroes, real heroes, because all of them are echoes of the goat, the greatest hero of all time. And you all know it. We know who it is. It's written into our story. We feel his power, his transformative power. Talk about courage and honor and self-sacrifice for a cause bigger than self. Talk about leaders eating last. Talk about a level five leader with an incredible blend of humility and a staggering, stunning, selfless courage. 
Why do you think his disciples, to a man, were willing to die for him? And millions later, 2,000 years later, still would. I hope I would. I hope you would. And here's why. Here's what the Bible says about the greatest hero of all times. It says, though he was God, though he was actually God. That's the New Living Translation. I wish they hadn't used the word though. In the Greek, all it is is just being God, because he's God, because Jesus literally is the omnipotent one, the omniscient one. There's nothing doable that he can't do. There's nothing knowable that he doesn't know. He's just God. He's not creation like we are. He's creator. And he's not flawed like any of us. He's the only one who's perfect, who defines holy. Because he is God, and here's the twist, because he's God, he doesn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. I think the NIV does it better. Being in very nature God, because he really is God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Because the real God didn't like that. The real God isn't self-absorbed. In the Greek, it's a weird word. Literally, he did not consider equality with God to be a grasping. A grasping. A grasping for power. It's not what God's about. A grasping for respect. A grasping for worship. That's not what God's about. Because to God, being God is not about being served. Instead, because he is God, because he's God, he gave up his divine privileges, go figure. It's not really even though he's God, he emptied himself. I think what it means is because Jesus really is God, and because God is that kind of God, because that's what the real God does, he empties himself what it says literally he empties himself he denies his self it's not about his self guys who study this bible for a living call these verses the kenosis they call it the emptying and i know that part of the emptying is jesus giving up those divine privileges but i wonder if it's more like jesus is pouring himself out for us god empties himself the creator empties himself for us Creatures. If that doesn't blow your mind, you don't get it. You see, we think being God is about being served, being praised, being number one. People around you who want to be little gods, want to be served, to be praised, to be number one. And it seems like God's view of God is diametrically opposed to our view of God. To God, being God is about emptying his self pouring out his self it's amazing because he's God he gives up his divine privileges in fact it says he actually took the humble position of a servant he was born as a human being how is that even possible God becoming a man unless maybe you're like God the NIV says taking the very nature of a servant God being made in human likeness Became like one of us, still fully God, but now fully human too. And again, if that doesn't blow your mind, you don't get it. How do you figure an eternal God with a birthday? An infinitely powerful God with fingers and toes and skin knees and toothaches and mosquito bites. How is it that the one who spoke us into existence is now one of us? And yet, what if we grant that God is capable of doing something that only God can do? So what would seem like definitive proof that a man named Jesus could not be God, well, that's just God being God. And for some mind-blowing reason, when God became one of us, he didn't choose the form of a rich man or a king. 
You chose to be born to an unwed mother, so-called dad, very blue-collar. Jesus himself was not especially handsome or strong. And then he collects around himself this band of misfits, people kind of like us, his disciples. And in his world, where women and children knew their place, he elevated them and gave them honor. Now, have you ever been frustrated by the self-restraint of an all-powerful God? I'll bet you have. I mean, there's nothing doable that God can't do, right? And He's supposed to care, and He's supposed to love us. So haven't you ever wished that sometimes God would just take His gloves off, maybe kick some unholy tail, yank the bullies down, shut the mockers up, come to the defense of His kids the way we would if we could? How could Jesus really be God and be so humble? How could Jesus really be God and be so self-restrained unless humility, I mean taking the form of a servant, is part of what makes God God? And that was the easy part. It says when, when God, when Jesus, when, when He appeared in human form, He humbled Himself, He humbled Himself in obedience to God. How weird is that? God in obedience to God. And he died a criminal's death on a cross. <laughs> so you go from God to servant to death row felon, right? At least in our eyes. So Jesus literally accepts death. I mean, only God can choose death. I mean, you don't get that option, do you? Death pretty much forces itself on us. But in obedience to God the Father, Jesus the Son accepts not just death, but he accepts death on a cross, whipped until his human flesh is torn to the bone, nails driven through his hands and his feet, stabbed in a chest with a spear until the blood and the water flowed. And then God takes his last breath. God dies. Did you know that in the world of Jesus, the cross was almost a four-letter word? You didn't talk about the cross in front of decent people because it was so indecent. I think that was Jesus' most deceptive moment. Now, the minutes and the hours and the days after his birth, they were his second most deceptive moments. I mean, the Creator himself as helpless as a human baby totally dependent on a frightened teenager for food, for warmth, for protection. The one who actually spoke the universe into existence, babbling and cooing. Could God be any less God? Well, yeah. This was even more deceptive, right? A dead God? A God who seemed at that moment impotent? I mean, eternality is part of what makes God God, right? How can the one who by definition cannot die, die? Unless he really is God. And then we learn the why. We discover the incredible power of God that was unleashed by that dying for us. Until we realize that it was our death that he was dying so that death wouldn't own us anymore. Can you imagine the bewilderment of his followers when they saw Jesus alive three days later? I mean, the nail holes are right there in his hands and his feet. There's the place where the spear pierced his chest and punctured the cavity around his heart. And three days later, he's up and walking around. And then, why does he keep the scars? He didn't have to. Why did he keep the scars? And then can you imagine their shame as they begin to reflect and realize we had just abandoned God. We completely lost our hope in God. Because there's no doubt now that's who he is. We've actually been walking with God. We've been watching God work. We've been given a glimpse of God's heart. And now we see his real power. (laughs) 
and by his being here, his amazing grace. I mean, doesn't all this, Jesus standing here, mean that he could have not died if he had chosen? Doesn't it mean he could have snapped his fingers and crushed those who whipped him and crucified him or those of us who bailed on him? Thank you, God. Therefore, verse 9, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and he gave him the name that is above all other names. So God the Son descended. He emptied his self because he's God. And God the Father lifts him up. By the way, that resurrection from the dead was more than just breathing life back into Jesus' slightly used corpse. It was the Father's imprimatur on everything that Jesus had claimed to say and do. This was God saying, guys, this is my Son. You need to listen to Him. This was God saying, this is my Son. You need to follow Him. He really is the way, the truth, and the life, and everything else He claimed to be. Don't you dare blow Him off. You see, the honor that Jesus refused to arrogate to himself was lavished on him by a very, very, very proud father. So the father gave the son the highest place, and the father gave the son the highest name, which by the way is not the name Jesus. What do you think the highest name is? In the Old Testament, they didn't say God's so-called name out loud was too holy. God told Moses, tell them I am who I am. Tell them the I am sent you. The I am, the Yahweh. Some people would say Jehovah. But they wouldn't pronounce the word Yahweh out loud. The name was too holy to be spoken by sinful human lips. So whenever they would see God's name written, they would simply say the Lord, blessed be he. And the Father says, that's my son's name, guys. Jesus is the I am, the I am, just like he claimed to be. He really is the Lord with all caps. That's his real name. The name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, the I am, every knee, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Not just human every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father and it's going to happen someday guys every knee every knee is going to bow and someday every single tongue is going to confess that Jesus really is the Yahweh the Savior the Lord and if we get it right now right here Even if you get some kind of an inkling of it, it won't take some other day to get us to bow and confess. Because if we don't start bowing and confessing until then, it'll be too late. So if we really get it, if we really get any inkling of who Jesus really is and what he really did for us, we're going to start the bowing and the confessing right here, right now. Because he really is the ultimate paradigmatic hero, right? Right? the only one worthy of unrestrained, unreserved, uninhibited worship. Now, why did the Apostle Paul tell us all that? What was he trying to get us to understand? What's he trying to get us to do? What's he trying to fix with these words? You see, I skipped right over verse 5. I jumped right into verse 6. Here's verse 5. You must have the same attitude. You must have the same attitude Jesus Christ had. Huh? Here's the NIV. It's a little clearer. In your relationships with one another, you guys, us guys, we're supposed to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. We Jesus followers are supposed to treat each other kind of the way Jesus treated us. How's that going to work? What's that going to look like? I can tell you what the Philippians were doing instead. They looked like a lot of us. 
<coughs> excuse me, some of them were kind of selfish. They were self-centered. They were driven by this huge self. Does that describe any of us? Some of them were conceited. They needed to feel admired. Does that describe any of us? Some of them were arrogant. They kind of thought they were better than others. You know guys like that. You know, I'm richer than you, stronger than you, smarter than you. I've got a better body than you. I've got more followers than you. Do they describe us? Some of them were all about looking out for number one, which means looking out for me and mine. It's more about me getting mine than you getting yours. Ever been there, done that? Be honest. Some of the Philippians were complaining. There's always something to complain about, right? Always easy to see what's broken. Pretty easy to call out someone else's foolishness or someone else's sin. That describe any of us? Doing a lot of arguing, bickering, grumbling, quarreling, backstabbing, canceling. Hmm. Does sound like us, right? He's got us pegged. And the Apostle Paul says, Stop it. We're Jesus followers. We're Jesus followers. We actually follow the leader, right? And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Jesus did. Now, don't you think that would transform some people, some families, some churches? Unfortunately, there's often this chasm between the way that we Jesus followers live and the way Jesus did life. God says, God says, it's not about me. It's about loving on you. It's not about making you pay. It's about grace. It's not about grasping for me and mine. It's about emptying myself for you and yours. And if we're going to be Jesus followers, we need to do some Jesus following. We need to do some emptying and letting God do the lifting up because he will and God's going to lift you up way higher than you could ever lift yourself. And if we actually tried this stuff, guys, it would make the church the ultimate counterculture, wouldn't it? In a world obsessed with self, in a world captivated by idols, in a world filled with arrogance, anger, unforgiveness, in a world that either marginalizes or mocks our God, we're different. We try to think the way he thinks and treat the people the way he did. Do you think it will make your life worse? Do you think it would make your life worse to do things his way? No. Guys, heroes are those who live for something bigger than themselves. They have this courage, this honor, this selflessness. Let's be one of them. Don't get obsessed with petty idols. We need level five Jesus followers. Jesus followers marked by a weird, compelling blend of personal humility and fearless courage. Quiet, maybe. You don't have to be. Humble, absolutely. Packaged with this ferocious resolve to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Whatever the personal cost. Guys, Let's be like that. That's how to live a great life, a life that matters. And how could we ever serve a servant king without trying to be like him? Let's pray. Father, Jesus blows our minds, the humility and the power and the love and the grace Give us the courage to try to walk in his footsteps. And thank you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We're going to have a couple things that happen right now, guys. I'm going to give you a little bit of an invitation. Basically, if you want to talk about making Jesus Christ the king of your life right here, right now, let's get it done. We've got an elder praying for you in the back in that prayer room. You can slip back there and talk to him. I'm going to sit right down here in the front row and during this Lord's Supper time or during the song that happens right after it, just come down and let's talk.
about making Jesus your king. If you're looking for a church home and want Capital City, you need a church home, guys. You need a church family. But if you decide Capital City is the place for you, come on down and let's talk and let's get that done. We're going to do one other thing. Listen to these words. Put them all together. This is from the Good News Translation. He always had the very nature of God, but he didn't think that by force he should try to become equal with God. Instead, of his own free will, he gave it all up and took the nature of a servant. He became like man. He appeared in human likeness. He was humble, and he walked the path of obedience to death, death on a cross. For that reason, God raised him up to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name, so that in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven and on earth and in the world below will fall on their na- knees and openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. The Father's already elevated him. Someday all of us will. Let's do it now. We come around these tables. This is the result of Christ emptying himself for us. This is the result of his dying death. So we wouldn't have to face eternal death. This is grace. And when you come up here and you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're honoring him. And you're promising to follow him. Let's pray and then I'm going to invite you to the tables. Father, for your grace, for your power, for your wisdom, we give you thanks. For the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf, we give you thanks. We pray that you will be honored here today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Come on. This is church home. Isn't that cool? He's a Christian. Pretty easy to be a part of this church, basically. If he's the king of your life and you want us to be your family, go figure. You're welcome here, right? So I'm going to ask him to make this profession of faith. This is what binds us together. This is why this is a family that lasts forever. Just repeat this. I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. My Lord and my Savior. Welcome to our family.
Thank you, Joe. Thank you.
not enough to just say those words together. When we come together and we believe what God has to say, we have to live differently if they actually are true. If they're not true and the stuff that we've just said out here is just stuff, it's just, then don't change. Don't, don't, don't be changed by that. But if we know that God has done something amazing in our lives and we're following that example, trust me, our lives can look different. This world can look different when we are chosen by God. Just shout these words out to Him. I am exactly who God says I am, and I want to be able to worship Him for those words. Make sure that we have it from our heart. Here we go. I am chosen, not forsaken. What a statement to be able to say, I am a child of God. You know, this is a powerful passage of scripture that Doc has preached from today. And, uh, and I find it really interesting and really inspiring the way Paul starts this out in verse 1 when he says, if you have any encouragement from being in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, you know, if you, uh, uh, if you think anything of me, then make my joy complete by being one in mind and spirit. And he says, in purpose. And he talks about putting the needs of others before your own. My name's Mike Napier, and I have a couple of, just a couple of quick announcements about a couple of ministries, relatively new ministries, here at uh, Capital City Christian Church that, that I think uh, truly fulfill uh, that, that whole concept of putting the needs of others before your own. The first one is uh, Celebrate Recovery. You know, uh, 
again, as Christ followers, we have this incredible privilege, but also this incredible responsibility to make sure that we are, uh, that we are sharing the hope that we have. You know, Peter says to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope that you have. And so uh, there are so many people that are struggling with so many destructive behaviors and issues, things that they're having to deal with. Some of those people are people you and I know. Some of those are people that you and I don't know. But the, the great thing about this is God knows all of them, and he cares about all of them. And so uh, in, in helping uh, to, uh, to, to, fa to facilitate that love and to share that, that love and that hope, that can only be found in Christ. Celebrate Recovery meets here every Tuesday. Now, it's a 12-step, Christ-driven uh, ministry, I'll call it, meeting that's called. And, and so there's a meal that begins at 5.30. Uh, there's a large group that will gather in the Student Worship Center. Uh, that it's at 6.30, and then they'll break off into a smaller groups uh, at 7.30. And so if you think that you would uh, uh, like to get more information, if you think that you would like to be a part of this ministry, please don't hesitate to seek out John Sutphin, and he, I guarantee you that he'll get you plugged in somewhere. Now, the other part, and one of the bigger reasons probably why I'm here, is we're planning a party. And everybody likes parties, don't they? And, you know, uh, what we're calling this, and if you've, if you've seen uh, any of the information on October the 16th, beginning at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., weather permitting, we're hoping, we're going to be outside here, uh, but we're going to throw a Luke 14 party. And I'm not going to go into telling you too much about what a Luke 14 party is, but what this is, it falls under the umbrella of our, uh, of our capable ministry. And, and it's, um, what this is, this is an event where we are being delivered as we reach out to embrace the disability community and th their families. And so what we're going to be doing is it's going to be a fall festival atmosphere. We're going to have we're going to have fall festival games and a petting zoo and there's going to be food and cotton candy and popcorn. Uh, there's going to be a pumpkin patch. And I know that uh, Laura Hayden has been really working diligently and putting all this together. She's probably even contacted some of you. So what I would do, though, is ask you that if you would like to be a part of this, because we need you. We need volunteers to be able to do this, to be able to, to, to extend this out to, uh, out to the community and beyond. And so what I'd encourage you to do, if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, come and see me. Uh, uh, run Laura down. Uh, I guarantee you she will find a place uh, for you to uh, participate, for you to, uh, to serve. And again, it's just uh, uh, it, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to, uh, for me and for Paula, who will be here a little while la later, uh, just to be able to serve here with, uh, with the church family here at Capital City. Also, if you'd like to volunteer, you can go to the, uh, the, the Church Center app, I think, and you can find uh, opportunities there for you to go ahead and sign up. Now, one of the things, and as we kind of bring this thing to a close here, in this passage that Doc preached from today, and we talked about this a little earlier, but from verse 5 through verse 11, it's basically a, a song. Many, many scholars, I think, believe that that was actually a song, these verses that he's been preaching from today. And when... When, when Paul gives us this, this song, and, I, and so what I'd like to leave you with is as you go out into this week, beginning here today, from the time you walk out of here today, uh, my prayer is, is that, you'll t that this will be the song of your heart as you seek to have the same attitude of that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, thought equality with God not something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. He emptied himself, and God gave him a name that's above all names. And it's in that name that we assemble here today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us so deeply and so completely. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful, perfect example you've given us of how our lives should be. But more importantly, Father, we just thank you for the wonderful, perfect Savior you've given us in your Son, Jesus. Lord, may we take that love and that mercy and that grace and that forgiveness and that message out in the world with us wherever we go. And may we always be prepared to give an answer. Father, we love you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we ask you these things.